So welcome everyone um, to this uh, first session of the lunch. My name is Marius Busta. I'm working as a principal software development engineer uh, out of a unit that is called Developer Experiences um, as part of Microsoft Corp. Um, I'm actually based in Europe, based in Austria, in Vienna. Um, you might realize that when I'm having some strange parts and pieces in, in my expressions. Um, but my manager sits in Redmond, and we are part of the what we call global ISV team. ISV stands for Independent Software Vendor. So we are working with independent software vendors uh, on integrating uh, their technologies and platforms with our uh, technologies and platforms. And um, our main focus area, guess what, is uh, Azure and cloud. And today I would like to talk about the efforts that we have done uh, together with uh, Cloud Foundry from an open source perspective as well as on the commercial side with Pivotal um, with running Cloud Foundry on Azure uh, and as well talk a little bit about some more complex architectures that we have implemented with some of our global ISV partners. So I'm just curious uh, who has used Azure before? Who knows about, okay, so that's maybe six, seven, eight, nine, ten-ish or so. Um, so who knows about Azure then? So quite a few people, yeah. So Azure is Microsoft's public cloud platform for those of you who don't know it. Uh, we have deployed it uh, across more than 30 regions uh, on the world. Uh, a region is usually a megadata center that covers approximately 100 to 120,000 physical machines where we run um, workloads of all types reaching from um, typical infrastructure as a service uh, workloads up to higher level pass uh, workloads such as machine learning, uh, big data workloads with uh, Hadoop and things like that. So that's kind of the quick what is Azure in a nutshell. Uh, and Cloud Foundry is one of the workloads that uh, we are very proud of to um, have on Azure. So with regards to that specific session, um, I'm not giving an Azure basics talk or something like that. I would like to dig into um, aspects that we have experienced with uh, running Cloud Foundry on Azure. So these are the main uh, key takeaways. We'll talk about where we are right now. Uh, I'll show you how you can get uh, Cloud Foundry running on Azure using Bosch. Um, then we'll talk about private cloud and uh, hybrid cloud deployments. Uh, that is the middle piece of the section. Uh, well, you'll learn about our vision in terms of providing Azure in private cloud, so in your own data center at the end of the day, and also where we are with uh, Cloud Foundry from, from that regard. Uh, and finally, we'll talk about uh, globally distributed architectures as we have experienced them with some of our global ISV partners. The reason why I've, that, I've put that into the game is because those global deployments are usually multi-region deployments, and you can look as a region as either a deployment in one of our other public cloud uh, vendors, is it uh, Pivotal or AWS or whatsoever, or it also could be your own private cloud. Uh, and that is the reason why I put that into the mix of the presentation. So, Cloud Foundry on Azure, where we are today. So today we have released a CPI implementation for Bosch that helps you to spin up a Cloud Foundry cluster on Azure and it helps Bosch to do some or perform some automated management operations against a Cloud Foundry cluster that has been deployed that way. Uh, that CPI implementation is all open source. Um, so we are actually developing it as part of the Cloud Foundry incubator project. So we are doing pull requests into the, their GitHub repository if you want so. Uh, and that CPI is under uh, like active development in terms of it's getting improved on, on a weekly uh, and monthly basis. So for example, we have uh, heard about Diego this morning in the keynote. Uh, we have that in our CPI implementation already, for example. Um, so that is one part of the story. Uh, the uh, Bosch CPI obviously works against the Azure management APIs. Uh, the Azure management APIs are just a set of REST-based, um, HTTP-based services that do allow you to run management operations against your own Azure account, or we name that Azure subscription. Um, and uh, those management APIs allow you to perform template-based deployments uh, with a technology that we call Azure Resource Manager Templates. Um, so the second piece that we have built 
for running Cloud Foundry on Azure is, guess what, a set of ARM templates um, that allow you to spin up a Cloud Foundry cluster easily on Azure. Uh, so those templates essentially are spinning up the dev box and the Bosch uh, director instance. And then from there, you just dial into or SSH into the uh, dev box and then uh, perform your actual Cloud Foundry cluster deployment using Bosch and uh, the Bosch CPI uh, that, um, that we have um, built. So let's have a look at that. Um, so let's go to my other desktop. So what you see here is the Azure management portal. It's an HTML5 based portal. I'm just running it in some sort of terminal management uh, tool that I'm using uh, for my own stuff. Um, so in reality, that's just a hosted browser. So don't get confused by that. Um, I just use that because I don't want to confuse my management stuff with things that I'm looking up in the internet. So that's the only reason why I'm working like that. Um, so essentially, one of the important things that you need to understand when you start with Azure nowadays is the concept of a resource group. A resource group is a logical grouping of resources that do belong together. Uh, and then on a resource group, you can uh, issue things like, um, like permissions for users, um, do role-based access controls, uh, and uh, perform joint operations on all the resources that are in such a resource group. So what I have here uh, in that resource group, uh, or in the list of resource groups of our Teams Azure subscription, so that has a lot of resources. We are doing prototypes and POCs with our uh, global ISV partners inside of that subscription. I have a bunch of them running here. Um, so CF Simple here is a resource group where I have deployed a Cloud Foundry cluster. Um, in Azure, and what you see here is a bunch of cluster nodes. Those are essentially the workers where the actual applications are running. Um, and then you have things like uh, network interfaces, public IP addresses, and so on and so forth. So that is essentially like a running Cloud Foundry cluster. But the question is, how do you get there, right? And the answer is to be found on a public GitHub repository um, under Cloud Foundry Incubator Bosch CPI release. Um, so that is where we have published all the ARM templates, where also the Bosch uh, CPI implementation is available on op uh, as open source. And that has a pretty um, detailed guidance uh, on, on, on how the deployment works and, and what you need to do, um, actually. Um, so. The first thing that you need, of course, is an Azure account or an Azure subscription. So you need to have Azure uh, and your own Azure tenant to be able to do that. Uh, it explains how that works. But then it becomes a little bit more interesting. Um, because then it talks already kind of very Azure style language. You need to create a service principle. So who could think about what a service principle is? So it's essentially an identity in a directory um, that you can give permissions to execute operations against your Azure subscription. Um, so essentially it's a service user that you need to add to your subscriptions directory where you manage all the user accounts and everything that is backed by a service that is more in the platform as a service um, um, kind of category from Azure which is called Azure Active Directory. So when you create a new Azure subscription, what you get is an Azure Active Directory and the actual Azure subscription into which you deploy your infrastructure or platform services. And in that directory, since Bosch CPI, in case of Azure, acts as a service which deploys virtual machines on behalf of us as the owners of the subscription, it needs to have an identity for that. And that is what you need to first create before you can start with that. Um, so there is actually a pretty detailed guidance uh, here uh, uh, for how to do that. But essentially what you need is, um, what you need is uh, the Azure cross-platform CLI uh, on, on your machine. The Azure cross-platform CLI is a Node.js based um, command line interface which works on Linux, Mac and Windows. Um, so I have, whoops, uh, clear. Clear Azure, I have that installed here. And then uh, it has all sorts of commands like Azure AD SP create dash dash help. 
Um, so that essentially is the command that creates a service principle. Um, and then that service principle gets uh, an ID and a secret for signing in. And this is something that you would need to fill in as a parameter into the template. And Bosch uses that principle to create the VMs and delete the VMs uh, or do upgrades of VMs or whatever it takes to manage the Cloud Foundry cluster. So after you have done that, um, you actually can just clone that repository here uh, in which uh, we have the uh, templates as they are developed and as they are released. Um, if you want to get more kind of uh, like frequent updates, then you can look at, uh, let me open up a new uh, tab here, Azure Quick Start uh, Templates. So there is another GitHub repository where we publish like uh, quick start templates, which kind of are more optimized templates for trying out things quickly. Um, so where you do need to do less configuration at the end of the day. So when you go with the plain templates from Bosch CPI, you need to think about things like IP address ranges and things like that, that you need to configure in the template um, for, for ARM. On the quick start templates, that's all pre-configured. So you don't need to think about those things and just can try it out quickly. That's the idea. Uh, and in there, we have a Bosch uh, setup um, repository uh, where we have pre-built Azure Resource Manager templates. And I have them actually open here in one of those uh, Visual Studio Code instances, Bosch Setup. Um, so that is actually the right one. So this is an Azure uh, ARM template uh, for deploying Bosch CPI and the Bosch Director into Azure. And then from there, I show you how, how you continue. Yeah? So this is the template. Essentially, the template uh, has a set of parameters where you can specify things like VM name prefixes. So like the main VMs, like the dev box and the Bosch director get that prefix. Your DNS name will get that prefix and things like that. Those are things that are more customizable when you take the actual officially released uh, ones from the Cloud Foundry incubator. Um, then uh, SSH uh, keys for SSHing into the dev box and things like that. Uh, and then you have uh, a bunch of variables. Um, and then it starts with resources like uh, network security groups that uh, define uh, the firewall rules for Azure. Uh, and um, then things like virtual, virtual machines, virtual networks, so of course, all that gets into a virtual network into which all VMs uh, are deployed and so on and so forth. And then um, machines. And finally, the first virtual machine that you get is a, a dev box essentially. Uh, so this is the, the template for a virtual machine. It gets the default name. Um, then in the top, there is a variable where you can specify the VM sizes. There you just specify the instance types, which defines how many cores, how many memory, uh, and so on and so forth you get. Uh, and essentially what you do is you take that template. You don't even need to look at that template. What you actually need to look at is the second file, the Azure Deploy Parameters file, where you can fill in your stuff. Yeah? And uh, this data here, that is from the service principle that we created before. The tenant ID is the ID of the Azure Active Directory. The client ID is the ID of the service principle that we created. And then the client secret is the password that you specified for that one. Uh, and that is all documented in there. And once you have filled out the template, I have filled out one here under debug.azuredeploy.parameters.json. I'm not going to open that up because it discloses my subscription IDs and the secrets and, and some things. Uh, you actually can pass them in through shell parameters as well if you prefer that. But um, if you have that large number of parameters, that becomes a little bit more of scripting effort, essentially. And what you do then is uh, you essentially um, go there and say Azure group create uh, Maria SCP CF Summit uh, Live. So that's the resource group. It gets a default location, uh, North Europe, enter. Uh, and then you create a deployment based on, that, um, based on that template with the appropriate parameters file. So, oh, thanks. 
let's go to quiet hours here. So, and then you say Azure uh, group deployment create, um, and then you give it uh, the resource group that we just created, Maria SCP CF Summit uh, Live template file Azure deploy dot JSON parameters file file add debug dot Azure Azure deploy dot parameters and then it gets a deployment name CF Summit deployment zero one enter um, and that starts the deployment of the uh, um, of of the dev box and the Bosch director. Actually, for the Bosch director, there is a parameter, so it deploys multiple resources in parallel. For the Bosch director, there is a parameter in the template that says auto deploy Bosch that is disabled by default. So from a learning experience, that is what I would suggest to do. From a production experience, uh, I would kind of automate the entire flow. Um, and then just go to bed and on the next day or morning, you'll have your CF cluster running. Or go for a coffee. Huh? So um, that runs then. After you have that, what you can do is SSH into the dev box. So this is what I have done here. So that is my dev box, uh, CF simple. So that is just my uh, existing um, my existing deployment. And by default, we have configured the ARM templates in a way that they are working on Ubuntu LTS 14.04. So that is what we have here. Um, and when you, when that deployment that I just started is completed, what you get essentially is um, a directory with a deploy Bosch shell script. So that is then, if you selected auto deploy Bosch, you don't need to ex execute that. If you have disabled auto deploy Bosch, what you need to do is like run that script. Um, so that is what I did here. And that deploys your Bosch director using Bosch. Uh, so that runs then for a while uh, since it's downloading stem cells and the likes uh, from central uh, CF repositories and puts them into Azure storage from where it can then deploy virtual machines. Um, after you have done that, what you can do is deploy Bosch. So for that, there is a second script. Um, so let's go back to the active window, which is called deploy cloud foundry. And then uh, before you do that, what you would need to do is look at um, look at a Bosch YAML file, uh, which would define the cluster setup for Cloud Foundry. So what we do with the quick start samples is we like look at the Azure ARM template and the parameters that have been passed into that, and we generate a Bosch YAML file that matches the parameters that you specified in the, uh, in the original ARM template. So, uh, and we have then two manifests that we generate for the quick start. One which works with a single worker CF node and the other one which works with multi-worker uh, CF nodes. So multiple uh, VM CF, that's a standard Bosch YAML file at the end of the day. Um, where everything, including the director UUID and everything is like uh, uh, pre-filled if you want so. Uh, the IP address ranges, those are those which have been defined in the ARM template. So when you take the native templates from the Cloud Foundry incubator projects, these are additional parameters that you would need to take care of. Uh, and after you have that deploy Bosch running, you have your CF cluster running in Azure uh, and you can start managing it with the CF CLI. Um, and that runs then in a single Azure region. So if there are questions, I would like to defer them to uh, the end of the session um, since, since the time is fairly tight and we have uh, still two more sections to go. Um, so next one, Azure uh, and Cloud Foundry in a private cloud. So what you have seen now is Azure in the public cloud. That's across those 30 uh, plus regions in Europe, for example, it's Amsterdam and, uh, and Ireland where we have those mega data centers. But what if you want to run that in your own data center with the same templates, with the same management principles? Uh, and that is something where we made some, some rather big announcements earlier this year and also yesterday at Microsoft Ignite, um, which is uh, Azure Stack. So when you look at 
cloud platforms in general that provide you infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service, the high-level architecture always looks kind of like that. Very simplified, of course, right? So you have some management tools and portals. You have an application deployment model like Azure Resource Manager in case of, of Azure. You have the foundation and you have a fabric controller which manages everything. Um, now, we have that in the public cloud and what we are doing with Azure Stack is porting that back to enable you to run it in your own data centers. Um, but not just the infrastructure, but also the services that are running on top of that infrastructure. So it's not that we just give you the, uh, like, um, uh, the, the Azure environment that would kind of be similar, uh, like OpenStack in your own data centers. What we give you is Azure in your own data centers. Not with all services yet, but our plan is to have as much parity as we can have so that we can give customers and partners as many options as, uh, as possible. Um, the management experience, the scripting experience, the management APIs are the same for both. Azure Stack is currently in a uh, public preview. Uh, um, actually, it's preview two, that we, technical preview two that we currently have available and we are uh, planning to launch it um, around mid-2017. So now, um, that said, this is like high level view of PaaS and IAS services in Azure. Just to give you an expression, uh, this is the beginning of a journey. So Azure Stack, when it will ship, will not have all the PaaS and IAS services available. Just those where we get most uh, feedback from our customer base that we should prioritize those services at the end of the day. Virtual machines, virtual networking, and, and all that stuff that is needed for Cloud Foundry will be there. Yeah. Um, so what does it mean for Cloud Foundry on Azure? So essentially what we have seen are those ARM templates. So the, these templates do deploy Bosch and the Bosch director in Azure Public Cloud. What we are currently working on, since Azure Stack has a bunch of limitations with regards to those API, uh, APIs, ARM APIs, and uh, with that also the template functions that it supports today, we are backporting the uh, ARM templates that we have for Cloud Foundry available today as part of the Cloud Foundry incubator. Make sure that we only use the API surface that is available in Azure Stack. And then we'll, as soon as we have that done, we'll publish it uh, on our GitHub um, repository with the quick start samples uh, as well as the uh, Cloud Foundry incubator as well. Uh, and then deploying Cloud Foundry on a private cloud Azure Stack environment would uh, be exactly the same what I just explained. Because the Bosch CPI, that goes against ARM APIs, which are pretty common for both platforms, so we don't have a lot to do there. Uh, but on the template side of the house, we used a lot of convenient functions that make it easier to author the templates, um, which are not yet there on the Azure Stack. So there are some examples on the deck of that. As soon as that is available, um, you'll find it on our public GitHub repositories. And that is kind of our private cloud uh, story when it comes to um, Cloud Foundry. But I would like to expand that story by looking at two real world deployments uh, that we have implemented with partners, uh, which are cross cloud, cross region deployments. Um, and then put that back into the context of hybrid as well, because hybrid deployments and private cloud does not necessarily mean that you have Azure running in your data center. And we know that, and we want to enable all sorts of hybrid scenarios, not just the one where you have Azure Stack running in your own data center. Actually, we assume that it will take a while till we have customers running Azure Stack, so the reality will be that most of them won't have Azure Stack anyways in their data center. So we are looking at, um, at those scenarios actually even more um, as, we talk, as we are talking about today. So, and I think globally distributed environments are a very good example of that because they put you from an architectural point to an edge that will for sure enable you to implement the same thing with the public-private cloud setup because that's going to be a little bit more easy uh, or easier uh, at the end of the day. And that is the reason why I added that section. So now, when you run 
globally distributed environments. And in our case, we were working with uh, three global ISV partners over the course of the past eight months to implement uh, different types of distributed Cloud Foundry deployments on Azure. Um, all three of them were pretty large enterprises. Um, and um, when you look at a distributed cluster, there are different ways how you can achieve things. And depending on what requirements you have, especially in terms of uh, recovery point objectives and recovery time objectives, you might want to take uh, certain compromises or not, but then live with an increased level of complexity. Uh, so that is always the conversation that I would suggest anyone should have before you jump into something like what I'm presenting here right now. Because uh, if I would stand here and say, oh, things are getting easier with that, I would be wrong, right? I mean, we know this will increase complexity. Um, so essentially, the options that I have seen are two main options. One is a little bit easier, the other one is a little bit more complex. The first one that I've came across is like running two separate individual Cloud Foundry clusters across two Azure regions or an Azure region and another cloud provider um, there. That is easy because you manage those CF environments pretty individual from each other. You don't need to really connect the networks uh, or not for the sake of the Cloud Foundry cluster at least. Um, and from that perspective, that's easy to do. That works well for cloud native applications which are stateless, which are outsourcing state to th some third party services. But if you run everything inside the cluster, then that deployment topology might not be appropriate or um, fulfill your requirements. So the other option is the hot one, which is running a single CF cluster across two regions. Uh, and we are going to look at both of them from the Azure perspective. So here I have put together a little sketch uh, of what we have, work, have been working with one of those global ISVs, that's the separate CF cluster deployment. Uh, essentially in green you see an Azure region, inside of the Azure region in the customer subscription we deploy the VNet. So the VNet uh, essentially groups all the machines inside of the region together. Um, so that is one part of the story. Then there is the other region, um, and in the other region, you again have the uh, Cloud Foundry cluster running, individual on its own. Yeah. Um, so for the cluster, what we have here is we have different groups of virtual machines, uh, which we group together in uh, what we call Azure Availability Set. An Availability Set in Azure is a concept that allows you to group machines together which must not fail or be down at the same time like because of a failure or an update or whatsoever. With that, the Azure, uh, the Azure Fabric Controller makes sure that those machines are deployed across different fault domains in Azure. A fault domain is depending on how the data center is deployed. Uh, if it's a rack deployed data center, the fault domain is a rack because the rack has a top of rack router which connects all machines of the rack to the rest of the data center. Uh, that's a little bit simplified, but essentially that's, uh, that explains the concept. So if you put VMs in an availability set in Azure, uh, the fabric controller makes sure that the machines do not get deployed on, the virtual machines do not get deployed on, on the same rack. So we have that here for um, a reverse proxy, which that customer needed for certain authentication scenarios. So essentially they pulled authentication out of Cloud Foundry into their own infrastructure. Uh, and then we have an availability set for the Cloud Foundry cluster uh, resources, and finally uh, for some uh, other external storage resources like MySQL. Now, what they did then is they had a cross-region connectivity, but not for the sake of Cloud Foundry, but more for the sake of syncing the MySQL cluster underneath. Um, and uh, the Gamefire cluster underneath, which did run outside of Cloud Foundry uh, in, in this case. So, and then the final thing that you need to do is put a global traffic manager on top. So that's the Azure Traffic Manager, which is a DNS-based routing, uh, routing uh, which can route traffic to one or the other region based on load balancing probes, um, health checks, and the likes. Yeah. So that is one kind of deployment. 
That would go pretty much of what we have seen before, like you deploy the individual clusters like we have done it before and then you're pretty much done. And then you set up the cross-region VNet. The other one is exactly the same, except that uh, we again had to run certain resources outside of Cloud Foundry and I'm getting back to that. But we had one single Cloud Foundry cluster running across regions. And in that case, what you see in red are the resources that are used by Cloud Foundry themselves to, or itself to manage its configuration. For example, Cloud Foundry has the concept of a configuration database called CCDB or a user accounts database called UAADB. Um, and those are by default, if you take the default YAML file, they are stored as part of nodes inside of the Cloud Foundry cluster. If you want to operate a single cluster across region, that doesn't work because Cloud Foundry does not give you a lot of control in terms of how to structure those databases in terms of how they run inside of the cluster. But for a cross-region deployment, you need that control because you want to replicate them depending on the RPO and RTO that you need to fulfill. So we had to pull them out, run them as cross-region clusters in separate virtual machines or use third-party pass services like ClearDB, which is MySQL as a service on Azure, um, and outsource the configuration to those, um, to those services rather than running them inside of the CF cluster. The other thing that we had to do is like modify the, the Bosch YAML file for the Cloud Foundry cluster to make sure to have different uh, cluster resources for the different zones. So let me show you what I mean by that. So that, that is actually the, the next demo already. So I'm picking that um, up front. So now when I look at Visual Studio Code here, uh, on the left-hand side, I have a YAML file for a cross-region Cloud Foundry cluster. On the right-hand side, I have the ordinary cluster. So let's search for CCDB. Um, so in that case, that is the configuration that how it looks like when CCDB runs inside of the Cloud Foundry cluster. So there must be, so DB scheme, so it's using Postgres and it's running directly inside of the cluster. So here, CCDB. Um, here what we see is an external IP address or an IP address in a cross-region VNet that has the external MySQL cluster running. So that is the easy part. The trickier part is the NFS server that uh, Cloud Foundry uses for uh, the storage um, aspects because here uh, on the right-hand side, it just deploys an NFS server inside of the cluster, whereas on the left-hand side, we had to specify an external uh, NFS cluster with its IP address. Now, that's easy, right? But you have to run NFS cross-region. Uh, so that is where you need to do things like running NFS nodes in one side and on the other, connecting them with DRBD and things like that. And currently, I have all of that work in progress on my GitHub repository. Uh, MSZ cool, Azure quick start templates, but not this one. Oh. So, where, um, Bosch CF, Bosch cross, Bosch CF cross region, um, where I actually have scripts for the foundation that are automatically deploying things like a MariaDB Galera cluster across two regions. So that is here the jump box install MariaDB cluster and everything. So you can have a look at that. Probably you are more experienced in Bash than I am. Um, but this is what we are currently working on and open sourcing as well to enable uh, these kind of deployments, right? So that is one part, of course, but the other part of such an architecture is one side could sit in another cloud provider and when you think of the really large enterprises, they most often want to follow a multi-cloud uh, vendor strategy. So they would like to have, for example, one thing running in Azure and the other one running in their own data center or in AWS. Um, and uh, unfortunately, time is a little bit tight, so I won't be able to show that anymore. Uh, but I can actually, and I will blog about it, so you can read, read about it after the, 
the conference. So my blog is blog.mszcool.com. You'll find it there today or tomorrow, let's say tomorrow. Um, what I have configured here in my Azure uh, subscription is a, so when you look at this here, so the deployment is one part, the DNS-based routing is another one. So what I have configured here in my subscription uh, under CF Region Foundations is a traffic manager um, just to showcase the hybrid aspect, a traffic manager policy that indeed includes both, when I look at the endpoints, a Pivotal-based deployment which uh, runs in Pivotal's own cloud uh, versus an Azure-based deployment which runs uh, in Azure, in the CF cluster that I, I've actually deployed. And that one gives me a single endpoint for both of those deployments. Yeah, I don't wanna submit anything. So let's copy that. That's the app on Azure. Um, what I plan to do in the session is like stop the app on Azure and then after two or three minutes we would fall back to Pivotal and that is a very good example where you have cross cloud provider high availability uh, with uh, actually uh, two different Cloud Foundry clusters running uh, between Azure and a different cloud. Uh, I promise you I'll have that blog out before September 30th uh, and then you can read about it and um, with that actually I think I, I should stop now, right? I'm talking too much. Thank you so much. Um, I hope that was interesting.